Okay, so coming back to, I'm just gonna talk quickly about some of the work that I've been doing in terms of research. So the, I, the how does AI affect teaching and learning and especially learning? So one of the things or one of the ways to think about AI is how does AI drive human cognition? So forever and ever, humans have been really good as a species in using external objects and tools. And so we have, not only can we use things that we find in nature, so we can use sticks and so on and so forth. One of the things that we have unique in some ways compared to other species is we can create new tools and objects to help us with things, right? So there's this canonical example that, you know, we use a stick to hunt or something or get a food from a tree. So can, you know, other species like a chimpanzee and we can create a sphere, sphere, so can a chimpanzee, but only humans create an arsenal or weapon and go up, have wars with other humans, right? That is something uniquely human is our capacity to kind of take these tools and things and do things very differently, which is also true for our symbolic system. So things like language, writing, right? So we have been able to develop these tools which have changed the way we work as a society. And for me, one big leap in there is cognitive artifacts, right? So we have created things like a calculator, computer as well, where we can offload a lot of our cognitive work to these machines, right? And AI, artificial intelligence, is in some ways this next stage of that where not only can we offload things like calculation, but we can even offload things like decision-making. So for better or worse, and where we say for better or worse is where the ethics issues come up, but we have these systems that can now augment what we do at a very different level than used to be the case before, right? So overall, if you think about our sociocultural development, as we have come up with these different kinds of tools, we have developed from groups to teams to communities, nations, we have all these ways we have come together as a society, but so have our ethical and moral values also developed, right? And a lot of things that we take for granted in terms of moral ethical things that this should be questionable, this is wrong. If you just look past and not in a very distant past seem very different to us. So our ethics and morals and values are always co-evolving with the technology that we develop, right? And that is something where I think AI in some ways introduces something very new in terms of take offloading our capacity for decision-making is just one example. And that's where I, we need to rethink what our ethics, morals, and values are going to be as a society as AI becomes part of even more things, right? And if you look on the right, so what has happened is as we have moved across here, we have augmented more and more things that we do, but we have also offloaded our agency and control. So fewer things are under our control if we have given them to machines, to, so to say. So just kind of thinking about this more is AI is in some ways is doing a cultural reorganization of our cognition, right? So it's not just the, the fact that it's in machines and we can use it as a technology, but it's playing a very strong symbolic and metaphorical role. And this happens with new technology where it drives narrative, where we start thinking about or talking about things in this metaphor of AI. So it's not just a thing, it's a metaphor for us to think about the way that technology is shaping human culture. And there's a complexity and a network effect of AI driven applications because we have these things that make these decisions that affect other decision-making in some other system and so on and so forth, where the complexity is so high that we often actually don't know what is happening. So deep learning is a very technical example of it, but if you think about, you know, this canonical example of Boeing and the Boeing disaster is where the small piece of software that was supposed to help pilots navigate a situation or automatically navigate a situation where the plane was misbehaving ended up leading to disasters because there were 
so many ways it interacted with so many other systems and social practices, right? And the first, the, th the third thing about AI in terms of our society is what I like to call like the cultural imperialism of very few people having control over the AI system. So in higher education, people talk about platforms, even otherwise, you know, you have the Facebooks and the Googles and so on. And what is happening is those who have more data, who have more computing power, have even more and more of it, right? So in some ways, who gets to say what we develop as AI, why we develop it, is becoming Im imbued in certain companies, right? So that's the cultural imperialism around AI. That's kind of the other thing that is related to the cultural reorganization. And now I'll come to the institutional side of things. Uh, <laughs> So we were thinking about research, teaching, and then institution, okay. how our institution change. And one example of how okay. institutional values of higher education have changed is how readily we have adopted technology, especially during COVID, right? So a lot of you here have either used video-based <laughs> monitoring like Proctorio on the faculty side or as a student, you have been on the other side of it where video is monitoring how you do things, right? And a lot of these technologies have been used. They're used a lot without a lot of any kind of questioning of, do we need them? Do we need to collect data of students? Do we need to collect so much video data about students? What effect does it have on those who are sitting on the other side of it? Do we even know how these technologies work? So as an institution, we don't have really good frameworks for us to think ethically through the use of technology. And I think we're gonna talk more about this later on. So uh, the concerns, I'll just list some of the things that I have in one of the paper is, I mean, we use a lot of these platforms for efficiency, productivity, scalability, which is like a positive thing that comes out of it. And, but the questions are around power and control. Who has power, who controls it, who makes these decisions, privacy and surveillance, what are our assessment practices like and why? trust and responsibility. So one of the studies we have done with students about it is the more of a technology interface they have between themselves and their educational experiences, the lack, less they trust them, right? And so the lack of trust that students invariably have through the system with the faculty and with the institution. And of course, a lot of these systems because of all the inherent bias and so on lead to questions of inclusion and equity. I'm gonna slip this slide and so I also teach courses on ethics in our program, especially technology ethics. And one of the ways we have tried to tackle this issue of how do you teach students about ethics is what we try, what are we really trying to teach students? And one of the things is how to take different perspectives. So anytime you think of an AI system that is being used anywhere, the the different stakeholders who are involved in that. So there's somebody who has developed the system, there's somebody else who has kind of implemented it, there's somebody else. So there are all these things that come together. And so one of the things we do in our pedagogy is we use role plays and students are assigned different roles. So like in the case of a Boeing case study, somebody plays somebody from pilot, there's an airspace researcher, there's a software engineer, and then people come together and we create a scenario that they have to discuss. And the idea is that they have to reach some kind of consensus solution on a problem, right? So that's one of the ways that we have been teaching about AI ethics a lot. And there's a range of papers that have just come out on that. And we see quite clearly that students do take different perspective and they're able to take the perspective of different people when they engage in this role play thing. And we also see that one of the things, one of the uh, criticisms of ethical teaching of ethics is that you either focus on a very, very small nitty gritty of a problem or on a very macro level, but role play this can be designed to help students link the micro, meso, and the macro level of thinking. So, in the interest of time, I'm going to stop now. You know. <laughs> Quick draw. Quickest draw. My presentation. I'm going to zoom to share, right? Sure.
There you go. Okay, right. So thank you. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, move my glasses. Um, so thank you very much for that presentation. Um, in, in rapid fashion and covering a really interesting uh, range of issues. And we're really sorry about the, the technical problems we had at the beginning. Hopefully now can be sorted out for the remainder of the session or conversation. So now can I introduce please Nina Simpala from UCL School of Management. And Nina, is, as you can see, is um, gonna pick up and in a sense, not directly, just not following on and I kind of, I've read your paper and I'm gonna to respond to you, but rather kind of, I've read some things and issues in what you're gonna say, that you've talked about it. And I'm gonna trigger, uh, I ask the question, how do we trigger an ethical mindset amongst students, amongst academics, amongst the population in general, around the issue of AI? Tommy, can I check with you that everything is working yeah. sound-wise on Zoom? Uh, um, they can still hear us? From the feedback that I am seeing, they're Okay, <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm here actually just to talk about my teaching at UCL. So uh, like Aditya, I teach the ethics of AI. Uh, I'm a professor of management education at the UCL School of Management, uh, and I teach an elective module in the ethics of AI. An elective module means that any student at UCL, if their department allows, can choose to study this elective with me. So generally on a normal year, I have about 40 students taking the module. So it's not a huge module uh, within the School of Management. We often have 200 students taking our modules. So this is nice and small and sort of an intimate uh, module. Um, so I wanted to divide my presentation into three parts. First of all, I'm just going to make a couple of observations about the context in which we are teaching the ethics of AI, uh, especially how we are teaching a topic, as Aditya was saying, where the norms and policies surrounding the ethics of AI are constantly uh, uh, developing. So we are actually teaching students something that might even only happen in the future. So it brings its own challenges in terms of pedagogy. I will also refer to some ethics theories a little bit uh, as part of the context. Then I move on to talk about mindset development, because in the area of ethics, AI ethics currently, things are still changing. So for me, the most important thing to encourage or trigger in students is a certain mindset, which is aware of moral issues relating to AI technology. So I'll talk about moral awareness, tools to explore ethicality of AI, and exposure to certain kinds of decision situations. A little bit like your scenarios, but I'm using a different um, pedagogy. Actually, I might borrow some of your scenarios in the future. Are oh, they excellent? Uh, I will definitely try to use them next time I'm teaching the course. And then in the end, uh, like Aditya, I'm just going to focus one of my pedagogical elements on the course, which is using a podcast. Uh, so all of my students do a podcast about AI ethics. So first, the context. Um, so we are teaching a topic where during a normal year, when I'm teaching this module, there will be many new AI applications and technologies coming out during the course. And the first thing students often do is raise questions in the class. Have you seen this technology? What do you think? Now, <laughs> of course, we don't have answers to those questions. Uh, so we need to think as educators, what are we going to talk, uh, teach about ethics when we don't know the specifics of these technologies. And we also need to think about how are we going to prepare students for the future when the technology is going to be even more developed. Uh, so that's a challenge. Um, and then when you look at uh, theories of ethics, they very often are categorized into two kinds of theories, normative theories, which are the historical theories of ethics about how people should think about the good and the bad, so utilitarianism, for example, is one, et cetera, et cetera. But more recently, for the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a lot of new research in the field of what is referred to as behavioral ethics, especially in psychology, economics, neurobiology, or neuroscience, about what is it that people really do 
when they encounter an ethical dilemma? How do they make decisions? Do they make conscious decisions? What drivers impact on how they see ethical issues? So on my course, I do want to bring in concepts, elements from both normative and behavioral theories of ethics, but I'm very much focused on behavioral ethics because as human beings and as our AI is being integrated into our daily lives at all different levels, I think it's really important to focus on how we really react to these technologies. Uh, and that's why the focus really is on behavioral ethics. <laughs> Now he's going to come in and say, nobody heard anything. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. Um, and then my final note, uh, contextual note is that I'm not sure if you have the same uh, impression, but I feel that when I read the news in the morning, the BBC, The Guardian, New York Times, uh, Le Monde, Diplomatique, which is always critical about everything in the world, um, technology is often portrayed as a real threat. AI is going to take over the world. Uh, to destroy what is essential about human beings, our autonomy, our authenticity, authenticity is being eroded. Oh, sorry, I listen to lecture at the same time. Uh, and indeed, there are academics like the founders of Oxford. Oh, the corporate Oxford. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 it's okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, they're really cool. He has this intellectual so exercise about the paperclip for the experiment, where somebody, an engineer, builds a factory and the goal of that factory is to be as efficient as possible in producing paper clips and the factory could be AI becomes so efficient that it destroys the human kind because the human kind is not very efficient now to me yes as an introduction to AI ethics this is an interesting sort of angle and sometimes it helps to pay attention to ethics but I'm more interested, especially when I teach AI ethics, on the more micro level engagements we have with AI and how we have integrated AI into almost everything we do, with few exceptions, of course. Some of us have decided not to engage. It's difficult, but not possible. And yet, you know, AI calls, you, you, you sort of Google or search for failures of AI algorithms and you get pictures that are really entertaining. I didn't find one about heat yet. I'm sure after today <laughs> we'll have examples of AI. You need to unmute robots. You're going to see the train. You know? Yeah, actually, maybe these are delivery robots. Will not work in this heat, especially in London. Okay. Nothing does work in London today. Um, uh, so you know, we talk about AI as something that is going to take over the world. Yet they can't even deliver a pint of milk currently reliably. So there's a long way to go. And therefore, I really like to focus on the micro uh, level. Um, there's some interesting work being published by uh, Kate Darling from a MIT. She's written this book about, um, I can't remember what it's called, where she compares how the media talks about animal intelligence uh, and artificial intelligence. And her book is all about why is it that we talk in certain ways about AI as being a threat Whereas we don't talk about animal intelligence in the same way. Um, I recommend that book, it's really interesting. She's also done a really interesting tech talk about how we interact with AI-based robots. So then moving on to the second part of my uh, presentation, which is about developing this mindset, ethical mindset uh, in, in the students. Uh, so my overall goal there is to focus on enhancing moral awareness uh, and imagination around the ethical implications of AI technology. Moral awareness means that we see a technology and can see that it has moral or ethical consequences. We don't always think about this. When you see a new AI gadget, you're like, wow, I can do X, Y, Z. But sometimes you just forget that it might have some harmful impacts on society as well. And moral imagination is our ability to see the consequences of technologies. This leads to X leads to Y leads to Z, and at individual level it means this, at societal level it means this. So this is my aim with my teaching. I want to trigger this kind of higher level of awareness and imagination among the students. And I do it in multiple ways, but one way is, is that I make force the students to explore 
technologies of their choice. Uh, so last term, for example, one of my male students uh, decided to sign up to a period app. If you don't know what these are, they are apps that women can use to track their periods and also manage their mental health and mood. Now, this male student of mine decided to see, does it work if you're male and you don't actually have periods? <laughs> what does the app do? And it, it was, I must say, it was one of my favorite uh, assessments ever. Uh, this student signed up uh, for the app, then he started putting in information, because even though obviously he didn't have the physical side of their yeah. app, uh, the app actually asks you questions throughout the day. How are you feeling at the moment? What are your thoughts now? Uh, and then you say, yes, no, I'm feeling great, I'm feeling a bit uh, down, I feel blue. And in this way, the app collects a lot of daily information about you over normally a month. Uh, and you start getting um, prompts like many people like you are feeling in this way, in this uh, today, uh, we would suggest that you do X. And then he did these things. So if the app said, take it easy today, don't do sports, he was like, okay, I'm going to take it really easy today and I'm not going to play football. And, and then his assessment was like, okay, well, I did all of this. And obviously then he started look at, uh, looking at what are the ethical uh, implications of this, pointing out that there are serious privacy issues. Some of these app companies are using their... Uh, some of the app companies are selling this data to marketing companies who are using the data to try to target you. Well, let's say women with a certain point of the month or a certain kind of food or certain kind of products. Obviously, highly ethically concerning, but also there are perhaps even worse um, concerns around these apps, which is about the health and mental health advice these apps do without having checked it uh, with clinicians, for example. So it's an example of, by exposing students to a lot of examples of this kind of various technologies, sometimes even technologies that don't really, haven't been developed for them, I try to sort of make them see and always approach everything from this ethical uh, viewpoint and use multiple conceptual and other tools to think about what the ethical implications might be. Um, so this is another example, but I won't go through it. So one of the weeks I spent on facial recognition uh, and privacy, it's a topic I love because Jeremy Bentham, our sort of founder, but not anymore. What, what, what are we supposed to say now? Inspirational founder, who wasn't the formal founder. Uh, so he's developed some of these concepts that are really interesting for facial recognition technology. So with my students, we go to see Jeremy Bentham. We even wanted to go to Wandsworth Prison, sorry, another prison, Benton Wheel, because Jeremy Bentham has partially designed it, I understand. Uh, and, and then we think about how his theories apply to facial recognition technology. My second point about uh, developing uh, this mindset in the students is about it's, it's, it's giving students access to all kinds of technologies and our analysis of the ethical concerns surrounding them before they encounter those technologies. All right, so very often we, we are prompted to do something new on our mobile phone or we have a new technology and we make a really quick judgment without really thinking about the ethical consequences of those judgments. And once you have sometimes accepted something, the data is out there and you will not get it back. So therefore, I think as educators, one of the important things we are doing is to try to prepare everybody for making conscious decisions about AI technology from the ethical point of view. Um, and it's especially important in the context of some research coming out from neuroscientists, which shows that when we encounter serious moral dilemmas, we tend to make intuitive, quick judgments about them without thinking about them. So for example, I love animals. If I ever saw an animal being hit, I would know it's wrong. I wouldn't think, oh, you know, it would be wrong because Jeremy Bentham said blah, blah, blah. You know, you know instantly whether something's right or wrong intuitively. You sometimes even feel it in your gut 
And it's actually because it, it, you, you do think that you know that. I'm not gonna go into details. Uh, but it shows that many of our moral judgments have become physically, biologically embedded into us. And we don't think about them. However, we do use ethical theories to rationalize and explain our feelings afterwards. And for me, it's really important that we expose students to all kinds of dilemmas before they develop these biological based responses to ethical dilemmas. And finally, um, we wanted to uh, showcase one of the pedagogical aspects of our teaching. Uh, so on my module, um, the students do a couple of assessments. One of them is a podcast. It's 40% of their overall mark. Uh, they can do a podcast on any topic they want. The newer, the better for me. Uh, but they do have to have a, at least one additional contributor. So they often interview a, um, a person on the street or they interview a professor. Uh, some have multiple contributors. I love these podcasts. Uh, but they have to also use some concepts to analyze the technology. Now, I was going to make you listen. I'm not sure this is going to work. And I don't want to get out of this window, John, for the Zoom. Uh, let's not, let's not, let's, let's, let's not listen to Maggie. Uh, but uh, I have a website that is publicly available. And I've made some of these podcasts available there with student permission. And I love this because everybody can listen to these podcasts, new students, faculty members, uh, potential employers, and some of them have a huge number of likes, not a huge number, uh, an okay number of likes. Uh, what, is, uh, what are the benefits of these podcasts? First of all, students learn new skills. Uh, I think some of the students are budding podcasters. Uh, after I've listened to their podcast, I've actually given them feedback and said, I think you should seriously think about having your own podcast, it was so good. Um, I also give them awards. So the best three podcasts get a prize, which is a certificate from my head of school saying you won the first prize in podcast. Uh, and these seem to be quite liked uh, by the students because they can use them when they are applying for jobs, etc., to show that they can do a podcast and they understand uh, technology. But for me, as an educator, what I really like about these podcasts is that students can study whatever and we can make those podcasts available. And therefore, on a normal course, students get access to four to different AI technologies and a student analyzing the ethicality of those uh, technologies. If I was doing that alone in class, I could never cover all of those technologies. Uh, and also, uh, the students always hear about the newest, exciting perhaps most controversial AI technologies, and they often do podcasts about those. So um, it's great in terms of keeping the teaching really fresh. I'm not talking about, or we are not covering things that were critical five years ago. These are things that are up and coming. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. I think the way that uh, Nina and uh, Aditya um, both managed to offer us a quick um, framing of issues around AI ethics in the higher education and then zoom in on actual practical examples of in their teaching, how they're actually tackling the issue is, is very complementary. It shows you how, at the same time, how complex the question is because it requires a diversity of responses. There's not a single, single and easy answer. Leslie, if I can invite to you now to come and offer a few kind of just comments and discuss it. So, um, Leslie's going to uh, not write, use PowerPoint, but kind of um, uh, in the true discussion fashion, kind of pick up and engage with both the uh, observations that have been made from in the first two uh, contributions to the conversation. So, which is Professor Leslie Gurley from um, UCL's Institute of Education, um, and over to you, Professor. Thank you, uh, David, and thank you, everyone. Um, I, I want to just repeat what David said earlier, I just want to particularly um, thank people in the room today who've made it here and it's such a hot weather it's really nice to have some, some students and um, colleagues taking part and we're hopefully going to have some discussion uh, very shortly. Uh, a huge huge ple pleasure and inspiration to hear those presentations and um, just so, such fantastic ideas to think about in terms of pedagogy but also um, the, the, the theoretical questions that are raised in, in this incredibly complex area. Um, 
socially, educationally, ethically, and in terms of um, obviously you know, future development and um, global challenges. Um, so where to even start? My interest in this area is um, as a researcher who looks at um, digital technology in higher education in particular, and I'm doing a project at the moment, which is really focused on the theme of surveillance in particular. So I'm interested in some of the topics already mentioned about how and in what ways do, do universities and the university sector more broadly surveil or watch um, students and academic staff and what we do and, and in, in various different dimensions. So the, I was really pleased, thank you David for inviting me today to yeah, just kind of join the conversation um, and uh, make some reflections about um, what we've heard so far. So briefly, I'm not, I'm not going to do a PowerPoint, but as I, in advance, I looked at some um, Aditya and Nina's um, published work, which was really fascinating. And I would really recommend that you look at that. And um, one of the papers that um, Aditya wrote really recently in um, the journal, um, Research and Learning Technologies, which is open access. Um, he talks about the duality of agency and representation. You touched on that in your presentation, this, this balance between, or this complex relationships between, between power and uh, agency, who's in charge, are we, really, are we, is the technology a tool that we can use for, for human progress? Or in the other sort of more dystopian viewpoint, is it um, something which uh, controls us when we have these images of the, you know, the, the robot overlords and so on? So, the, so there's that question I, I think is really important. It's something that I'm interested in looking at. Um, so what, what, I don't, I'm going to ask what I do is I'll throw out some questions if that's okay, and then I'll just open and you can give any of the questions that seems interesting. David, would you like the tradition you know, to have first answer yeah, and then yeah, we open yeah. the well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think, um, right, one thing I was, I was going to throw back at you, which was your, your model, your diagram, which I really liked, with the, um, you know, the, the, the artifacts, the calculator, and we move up to AI. You've got a progress model there, really, haven't you, where it's going up. And, and, and I think that's, it's very difficult to argue with that, that there is a sense in which there's a sort of cumulative human progress. Maybe as a critical point, you could see, is it always, a, prog a progressive progress, right? A form of progress which, which leads to um, greater moral, <laughs> you know, um, accountability. So that's my first kind of point. Don't have to answer that bit. So I'm just throwing it out. Another thing I'd like to suggest as well is when you were talking about um, about the um, about algorithmic practices and the and the ethicality of, for example, um, the the video monitoring and, and, and the, the effect that that would have on the student as a, as a human subject, right? Um, I wonder how unique that is to algorithmic practices. You know, I think there's a lot of ethical um, questions about supposedly, you know, analog educational practices that you could also say are a bit, you know, kind of questionable about power. So I think, I don't have an answer to this, but I think, you know, what is it that's qualitatively different? Right? I think there is something qualitatively different, but I don't think as a field, We've got the best answer to that question. So that's a couple of things. Um, I'll, I won't say much more about that. Just um, students might be interested, and really interested when you, when you have a chance to hear what you think about a camera watching you in your flat um, and you know checking to see which way your eyes are looking and things like that. It's, it's, a, it's a huge question. What does that do? That's my next question. What does that do to the student? Is the student a client of the university? They're certainly taking out a massive loan, right? So there's a sense that the student is, I don't agree that the student's a client or a customer, but unfortunately the sector is producing the students more and more like customers, but also they're treating them as objects of surveillance. Well, maybe we're all objects of surveillance as customers outside of the university. So there's questions there about, about biopower, about, about control, about identity, which I, I think we need to explore. Okay, last point. Um, I think touches on both presentations regarding, um, you focus on, on pedagogy. I'm also interested in what you were saying, Nina, about, about as I interpret it, you were talking about, um, you talked about behavioral ethics and, and the importance of granularity and detail and sort of large scale values. And I'm thinking um, that chimes in, I think, with 
the, the type of methodologies that we might, might want to look at when you're looking at distributed agency. So I'm interested in hearing from both of you about where you see the, the, the research agenda in terms of addressing what you just said about the unfolding nature of practice, the, the, um, the, the way that practices are, are not you know, moral absolutes, but they're obviously you know, constantly shifting assemblage. And does that mean that we can collapse into relativism? You know, there's, a, there's a problem there too. I think that's probably enough to be going on with. I mean, those are just a few contentions. Anything from any of that that seems interesting? How are we going to do this? Well, I, yeah. Let me just go and say, due to those small technical problems we had earlier on, what I forgot to say, I think we're going to have to bring we'll it to you. Yeah. Yeah. We'll start by inviting you both to pick up and respond to any aspect of uh, the points that Leslie raised. Don't feel you know it's incumbent to absolutely cover everything. But uh, just something provocative might be really quite exciting. And then we'll see if we can encourage somebody from the room to put a question or two and we'll look at the chat to see where, where the questions mm -hmm. go from there. And then I, I will keep my eye on the time so that we get around way into uh, coming with the, the, the rapporteur view towards the end. Okay? So I'll just move slightly off the camera to allow you to. And then, Leslie, if you'd like to kind of. Yeah. I don't know if any of that chimes in with your concerns or anything. So, the kind of the figure I had where things were moving up, right? Yeah. It's progressive, but I think actually it's cumulative because okay. what happens is we don't stop using tools and artifacts that we have developed earlier as you move up. I mean, the calculator might be on your computer, but we're still using those things. Language is still around. So in, in cognition, that's the interesting thing is it's always cumulative that we add on and have more and more things to think through. Now, this question, which is, you know, a really important one is, as we have developed in that sense of human cultural cognition or sociocultural uh, kind of development, have we also become more moral, ethical? Are our values better than before? I think it's a million dollar question and it kind of comes up every time I'm giving this talk. And I like to argue that in some sense, Yes, overall, where we are as a society, and but as so, I have to be careful here. This is, as, as my colleagues in Munich quickly pointed out, you should phrase it by saying if you're thinking about Western rational kind of developed places, yes, there is this progression because in other places, people live in very different ways. So they don't necessarily have the same or need to have the same kind, right? They can have very different kind of justice systems. They can have very different ethical and moral values that work in their cultural cognition kind of aspect, right? But for the Western side, I'm using the word Western loosely, but let's say rational developed kind of societies, which are also economically developed, Yes, there is this progression where our values, hopefully, well, have shifted for the better, but I was going to say Supreme Court decision in the US, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's exempt that. But overall, I would, you would say that, yes, things are better than they used to be. Okay, that's and that's, just, that's such a big question that we can yeah. be here all, all, all week on that one alone. And I, I might part company with you slightly on that, but let's, <laughs> let's send it on. You know, what do you think about it? I, I have to touch on the same conversation, yeah. Yeah. and then we'd like to hear your critical oh, view. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I like what you said about the cultural embeddedness, etc. But I actually feel that AI technology is currently at in a place that has almost brought us back a little bit about where yeah. we are ethically. They're at least making us question. That's what one of the points I was trying to say is they're making us reassess those things. Yeah. Or, or is it? But so yeah. yeah, so one typical example that at least my students talk about a lot is the silo effect mm. and um, how what happens on the in internet and how recommendation algorithms work are actually shutting down debate Yes. Which is fundamental for liberal democracy. democracy. Exactly. So yeah. I would say if we see liberal democracy as something that is aspirational and something yeah. we want to have, actually we are going backwards. Yeah, and I think this is where the problem comes yeah. in about the cumulative models, yeah. you know, the sense in which you know, we can sort of certain things have been banked and don't yeah. have to be renewed. And I think women's rights is, is an obvious example that has apparently been rebought every generation. But um 
I mean, thinking about, okay, we've talked about, you know, it seems with higher education's duty towards society and developing graduates and citizens, that's been a strong theme today. What about the, the university itself and its responsibility? Because yeah, one thing I wanted to ask you, Nina, is you talked about, um, I've forgotten exactly what the phrase you used, but there's like an awareness. Moral awareness. Moral. And you, you're inculcating that in students in as individuals and responsible citizens and workers and knowledge workers and engineers or sorry, management people in your case. What about the university's responsibility towards moral awareness as an institution or even sector? Do you see that as under threat? We talked before that we had, had grab lunch and we're talking about these large corporations like Pearson are penetrating the, 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 the higher education system. What's your take on, 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 on as a sector, how can you respond in this neoliberal marketized sector? What, what, what can universities do, if anything? Or is it all just inevitable when we give up and just try to navigate? So uh, I, I see where you're going, and especially here in the UK, less so in the US, where you normally reside, uh, there's a lot of regulations uh, being, I guess, imposed on universities. And there's an argument that universities are losing their autonomy mm. a little bit. Uh, there's some interesting old work by Sigmund Bauman, yeah. originally a Polish ethicist, but yeah. I think he's worked in a UK university somewhere in the North for ages. Please, Please. Please. Yeah. thank you. Uh, and he always makes this argument about how bureaucracy and rules and policies kill the ethical intuition and initiative in people. Right. So it's better not to have very detailed ethical policies or statements that people have to sign up to, because that gives us almost a license to not to, not to yeah. proactively decide for ourselves. So in those terms, I'm not sure, yeah, you know, some parameters yeah. set by the university are important, but it's actually more important to educate individuals yeah. who are able to take, yeah. and willing to take responsibility. Absolutely. I think that's right. Yeah. But I also think, just bit, sorry, really briefly, the universe itself needs to look back at itself, I think. Less regulation is better. Well, <laughs> what do you think? So, so I'm going to talk more about, you know, the field I know, which is engineering and engineering education. So if you look at the U.S., the biggest developments in terms of engineering education where technology is coming from is, so you had initially, engineering was done it was developed as a educational professional field to serve the empire in some ways, to serve colonialism, right? So military and royal engineers is where engineering's first big thing was. That's where it came from. And in the UK, actually, the first engineering college ever established, which was Cooper's Hill, was only to train engineers to go to India. It had nothing to do with training engineers even for UK. Right. So that's kind of like the big part where and the first military to kind of establish engineering school was the French. So the French model was kind of copied by everyone, but especially the Americans and so on. That's like the first wave of who are we training? Who are we teaching? Why are we doing it? But the big shift in the U.S. at least was in the late 1800s when they established the land grant universities. So the moral, moral, moral act, moral was some senator, I think. The whole idea behind that was the society is moving from agrarian to industrialization. And we have to make sure that people who have been in the farming kind of economy have a way to get trained to do new things. So land grant universities came in and they were initially called colleges of agriculture and technology or agriculture and engineering. So that was the one big thing, but still, one of the values that came, that has always been part of the engineering, even when it was with the military or the royal was the whole idea of service kind of thing, right? So the service aspect has always been there. And if you think about just the public works department that have been there, especially in countries like India, it all came from the service. So after the land grab, which was one of the most successful models of higher education, and then it went all over the world. I mean, India established 50 land grant universities or something following the US model. Now I think is the first time that that model has, is being challenged. Okay. So as we move into this AI automated economy and so on, we really are or need to kind of rethink 
how and why are we training people and what are the ethics that go with it. Absolutely. So, right. So there is yeah. this whole idea. I mean, they just created a service core for other technology and stuff in the US. So I think this is where we are again at that point okay. where we need to kind of rethink. That's really interesting. I think uh, it's time to open up the floor. And sorry, sure. we're just about to, did you want to ask something? Um, what's any questions, but questions on the, on the chat that and we'll, we'll come to those in a second. Thank you. But anyone in the room who wants to comment, let's hear from students first. If anyone wants to just react, respond, any kind of experiences that you've had with any of these things or what perspectives at the back. And you might have to, if you say it, I'll repeat so yes. people can hear up and then Zoom. Do you hear that? Can you repeat What's your, oh, yeah. Do you want to repeat the question? Uh, so the question is, what is the panel's opinion on deepfakes? Do I have to go first? No, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, you don't, it's your turn. Uh, so this is one of the podcast topics <laughs> for one of my students last year. She did amazing podcast. She actually used deepfake technology to create uh, another aspect of herself. <laughs> in the podcast so she was talking to herself it was amazing um it probably won one of prizes um there are so many different ethical angles on that um so obviously ownership for example when deep fakes are used to replicate dead relatives what are they rights as human beings whose existence has ended are uh, are we allowed to replicate them uh, through deep fakes so that's one set of issues we need to consider at societal level what is acceptable and what is not. Um, but then there are obviously other issues like deep fakes used on the internet. So we've seen, uh, especially President Obama has been targeted by all kinds of deep fakes and he's been made to say all kinds of things that he would never say. Uh, and and the, the problem in those is that more they are being used less we trust anything on the internet. Uh, and I think that's another contributor to yeah. this debate about public yeah. debate, liberal democracy. If we don't trust yeah. anything anymore, it's really eroding the quality of our societies and political communication. I think, I think what you said about playfulness, I think you were saying, oh, you know, we, we think it's just fun. And, but I think playfulness is actually quite often um, Intermixed with some of the most complex areas because they are playful. Everyone thinks it's just fun and lighthearted, and therefore, you, as you say, it starts to undermine how we read an image. You know, we can trust it. And trust it. No, I think, I mean, yeah, I don't know. So there's two aspects to me. One is like, there are going to be some technological solutions to protect because there are technology, technological manipulation. There is a way. What is this whole idea of like the dead relatives thing, right? Which to me is a different issue in the sense if some dead relative left you a diary to read with their messages and that diary was faked or is it real? So there's so many issues going on with that when you're trying to use it for those kind of things. Now the democracy and the public liberal democracy angle, I think that's that's where the real trouble is right now with defake. And I think, I don't know, I think it's a much deeper question because it's not just about the state itself is also using it and the political parties are manipulating and using it. So it's not just bad elements so are using these things, yeah. right? Which is the really problematic part of it is how do you, it's like, it's propaganda, right? What do you do about propaganda fundamentally? But interestingly, I think whatever I see on the internet nowadays, my first question nowadays is, is this yeah. real? Is it really yeah. So we already caught up with deep fakes in a way. Yeah. Is there any more questions in the, in the room? Or comments? Or shall we go to the chat and see if there's any comment? There's a one other question. Oh, sorry. Go on. Yeah. 
How do we, um, if AI is, 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 is threatening the agency of the human, how do we address, how do we detect that and how do we respond? Would that be the way that you... That you also asked about power imbalances? Yeah, power, so because so of power imbalance in which an AI is weakening human agency or taking away our power, then what do we do about that? That's a really huge question. But, um, <laughs> it is, but I think, so I, I would approach, or I like to approach that just thinking about the power imbalance that might exist without AI, right? So there are power imbalances already. And then there are two things AI can do. AI can create something new, some new kind of power imbalance in some new field. The other way is what, people in CS always like to use this word is, it amplifies it. Something already exists and then you bring it a technology that just amplifies or makes it worse, right? That for, and here the issue is, if we fundamentally as a society don't leave, live in a very equal society and we are not working at it just to create that technology or no technology, it's very hard for us to take the technology away and say, right, do anything about it. That for me, is, it's more of a fundamental thing is how do we create a society? And this goes back to if it's a liberal democracy, what are we doing to nurture liberal democracy and even without technology versus with technology? So what you're saying, I mean, I think the, what you're saying, I think very correct is that, you know, we can't see that these technologies are neutral politically. They're always in, in, implicit with, um, yeah. with, um, with existing power operations, but also they can amplify them yeah. or even change the, the whole dynamic. I mean, this is the statement I always say, like Henry Minsberg made, somebody made the statement that technology is neither good nor bad, neither is it neutral. Yeah. Right? So it really sure. comes down to the context. Then. And then it takes us back to things like the video and watching students. I mean, that's just one example in education. But would you I, I am tempted to use the word that you disliked earlier. Go on. Disruption. <laughs> I was she, 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 she's very critical about this term. Uh, technology is always presented as a disruption, and it's not always. Uh, but for me, well, maybe it shouldn't be. <laughs> you were you were <laughs> you were talking about the power imbalances, and yeah, I fully agree with what Aditya said. But also, technology can be used as a way to. Rebalance. Know, Rebalance. Yeah, Make things better. Yeah. I mean, medicine. I mean, we're thinking yeah. IT, but think about medicine, yeah. right? I mean, how much it has done for people. So. I think, I mean, I was slightly joking before we were having lunch, and I was saying, oh, you know, we're always saying that education should transform society or be disruptive or revolutionary. And I was saying, why are we always saying that? You know, I think, and I don't mean it should never be those things, but I suppose my point is that it's, it's become, um, I don't know, maybe a bit of a kind of cliche that, that, that all everything has to be transformed through, through education. But it can be tiny little uh, yeah. in improvements. Uh, so, for example, female entrepreneurs have had historically very hard time securing funding Money. from venture capital companies, these yeah. and angel investors. Uh, but I would say they have been very successful in crowdfunding mm -hmm. around AI technologies because there are lots of females who are interested in their products. It's just not those people who sit on the board of the venture capital company who are interested. So actually that's an example where yeah. perhaps technology has changed yeah, that's true. positively, I would argue, some of the yeah. arguments. Okay, there's, there's okay. two kind of, um, well, there's many questions on the chat. I'm gonna pick out two that are kind of quite close together because they relate to many of the topics we've been discussing. So one takes us back to the little discussion which kind of, um, Worked it up and then kind of back to quickly vanished, which is about the relationship between policies and human action. Yeah. Is yeah. it, is it is the, do, do we change things through policy or do we learn to autonomy uh, in, in different forms? But then that also led so can we talk about technology without also talking in the first place about what humans are wanting to do? Are we not running it? Are we not, this is a question as much to uh, us in the centre who framed it as AI, <laughs> ethics, and, and yeah. higher education. Not, to any yeah. the, the three of you. Yeah, yeah. Do we not have to also say, like, what kind of society do we want to live in? 
yeah. uh, and therefore what role does AI play? So I thought they were kind of two kind of interesting ways of coming at the, the, uh, from the chat of issues you want to Keep on Zoom, we've seen there was no chance, so we don't need to say all that. No, you don't need to say it What was the first one? I, well, the first one is, is the, the, the policy autonomy. Okay, so the policy autonomy issue. So the policy issue is very interesting because uh, I, you want to go first? No, Sorry. I was going to ask you to go first. I wasn't sure what was happening there. It's fine. Uh, what's happening is, Who's going to make policy when they don't understand technology? That's the fundamental question. I mean, we just don't have the expertise right now, or we lack the expertise, and technology is really leading things. And this is true also for law and jurisdiction is who is going to come up with those things where we just don't have, if people don't have the expertise to deal with it. So that's the problem we have run into. And that's with regulation, regulations as well. Regulations have been so slow. And in the US, I mean, there's also the geopolitics is of, do we want to have policy and regulation if it curbs disruptive innovation okay. when we are competing globally? Right. Um, I think it's a really difficult balance to strike. Um, when we think about examples like Twitter, Instagram, uh, TikTok, and the kind of content that is posted there, whether it's taken down, um, down in a timely manner or not, uh, you know, I think regulation and policy, regulation especially is needed for that, and those regulations need to be enforced. However, I think at the individual level, we also have to, in our societies and through our educational system, um, how do you say it, like nourish that individual responsibility. It's not enough to uh, trust policies and regulations. We need to be mindful all the time. And also, uh, before you no, uh, no, go on. criticize, no, no, <laughs> not in that way. Uh, going perhaps back to what you said earlier, um, we need to take charge of technology. If we take charge, it can really hopefully help us lead better lives. But if we don't take charge, technology is going to drive at least parts of our lives, make decisions for us which are not very authentic to us and who we want to be. And so, also, yeah, I mean, we this... need to educate these individuals who are. Who, who are able to do that if they want to do it. Absolutely. And it reminds me of when you were talking about, about um, the, the evolved biological nature of moral decision making. I was writing notes, no doubt, I, I, it's not my area, but I was thinking what then happens in a situation where we encounter um, black box situations which, in which we can't actually read fully what's going on. And we haven't actually evolved to respond to that, like, unlike seeing an animal being mistreated. We know uh, as, as, ma as mammals that this is wrong to our evolutionary I mean, we're already, we're already there. Yeah, but when, we, but when we meet a situation which is, which doesn't, we haven't met as a species over millennia that, that creates a different type of moral choice. I you mean, know, what happens then? Do you think that brings a challenge to the idea of, 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 of that kind of evolved response, but biological response yeah. in terms of ethics. So I think that's why that exposure I was arguing about yeah. is so important that you develop that more biologically embedded response by being exposed to different kinds of situations. Now we are in a technological mm -hmm. race. Yeah. So in a way, more we are exposed to different technologies and the ethical implications of them. So for example, some of the things that we take for granted of being unethical now, like putting certain kinds of images on the internet. You know, when they were first put there, it took some time for us to realize this is not true mm -hmm. practice. So exposure is very important. And transparency and on black box. Any sort of- I think Richard had a point that, that, that might have been lost, which is that we're already there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're already, some say, if you think about oh, yeah, deep so learning algorithms, I mean, yeah, we yeah, don't know. And this is my, precisely. so my argument is, I don't think we'll ever have explainability, even if we get a lot of transparency. So we yeah. have to yeah, think about other ways. And how many people in the world will have that anyway? Point zero 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 one. I mean, who has the expertise to really know that? So how do you do it? Yeah, I mean, so we, were, we were talking about this when we were first met to prepare for today. Uh, and you were talking about engineers, and I was talking about, because I work in a business school, uh, we've done some research on financial analysts and how they use AI. 
and they take personal responsibility for the AI they are using because it's going to impact their bonuses. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to impact their performance uh, appraisals. So they are saying, I actually want to almost become an AI engineer because I want to e yeah. understand exactly how that algorithm works. There is, sorry, there's a really interesting item on the chat that you, you can all just see the very bottom one, actually, but it relates to the, 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 the conversation just now. I have, I'm not familiar with the book, but I think- Oh yeah, it's an amazing book. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, I think that's that's an illustration yeah. of what you're describing. So the, the, the semantic approaches mm -hmm. there. And these are not even algorithms that are like deep learning algorithms. The example she has in her books, these are just like even simple. Yeah. But then you were making the point that uh, responsibility is more dispersed in engineering. In engineering, right? So therefore, people don't always have the same push to really understand. The, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this has been really fascinating. But well, it hasn't quite finished. Yeah, <laughs> because no, we're going to bring yes, Wayne in, so. and then yeah. that'll give time after Wayne's offered some reporter comments <laughs> for the three of you to respond to Wayne. So can I introduce everybody now to Dr. Wayne Holmes, please, who's been very uh, diligently <laughs> listening in <laughs> and acting as a reporter for the session today. Um, the invitation to Wayne was the kind of free range over. Um, with all the comments that were here, what was online, plus his own interests. And, uh, so, and, and Wayne's invitation comes about because he, with another colleague, and he'll tell you a little bit of this, no doubt in a minute, of a book that they've um, produced and edited, but is not yet, I think, hit the shelves, if I'm correct, show, yeah. which is a, uh, an edited collection on uh, artificial intelligence, sorry, artificial intelligence, ethics, and, and education in general, rather than specifically, say, higher education. But over, Wayne, thank you much, and over to you. Thank you. And well, firstly, can I just say, I really enjoyed this session. So many really, really um, important issues are brought up, and I, I've, I've learned tons, and I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation. And I'm, I'm just going to come up with some thoughts, because to kind of clarify your thoughts when so much is going on is quite difficult, so I'm going to do it in a, in a random order. I, one, one of the things, you know, we're talking about ethics, right? And one of the problems, the key problems with ethics, or one of the key problems with ethics, is on the one hand, we have cultural relativism, and on the other hand, we have ethical colonialism. And where do we sit on that spectrum? And how do we adjust? And how do we do it? We don't know is a short answer. You know, these are kinds of questions that, that we really ought to be um, thinking about uh, in deep terms. And I like some of the, the pragmatic, what you actually do um, micro level. I think that's really important. However, I think one of the problems with that micro thing is, you know, we can have a discussion about what's happening in, in, in British politics today, right? Voting going on. Um, and we would probably all disagree on different levels and different ways and the nuances. So it's really challenging. So I'm not saying we need to avoid these kind of things, but I do think we need to be quite clear about um, what, what, we're, what we're talking about and how we can um, engage with these, these challenging uh, topics. Um, I was really taken with, I think Nina said at one point, I think it was echoed by others, you know, um, because of things like deep fakes, because of um, the ways in which um, different algorithms are working to, to put stuff in and uh, the, the silos, and the echo chambers, all that. You know, we now don't trust what we see on the internet as much as we might have done when the internet, you know, we first encountered it. But, but the question that we haven't addressed, and I think, you know, I agree with that, the question we haven't addressed, what the hell do we do about that? You know, what do we do? How do we address these problems that we know exist, that we know are challenging our very democracy, human rights? And we can go on and on. How do we begin to address that? And one of the phrases that you used, Esther, was about, um, I think you said we, there's always a technical solution. I think you're talking about something very specific, but I'm picking up it nevertheless because I'm not convinced that that is true. And I think part of the problem is um, that when we have a have, have a, we identify a problem, um, and then we think well, the only way we're going to solve that problem is by putting more technology into that setting. And actually, often that's not the best way to go ahead. And what, one of the examples that, are, um, that come for me a lot is um, so I work in um, AI and education, and very often um, ideas have been put forward that we all know those um, schools in rural areas of developing countries that don't have qualified, experienced teachers, right? But we do have the technology, right? We have intelligent tutoring systems. So surely the answer is we should put those intelligent tutoring systems into those schools in those rural settings and we'll solve the problem. Now, 
I accept without hesitation that we might solve the lives, frankly, of a small number of children in those settings. But does it really solve the problem? I'm not convinced it solves the problem at all. All it's doing is kicking the problem down the road. Now, we take the technology into those schools. Well, firstly, do they have internet? Probably not, maybe, who knows? Um, do they have electricity? But even let's assume they do, within a month, has anyone ever used the computer? Have you ever found it crashing, stopping working? Um, you know, this happens all the time. Do they have the people that are able to get this stuff back up and running? No, they don't. So instead of taking this problem um, and, and looking at the, what well, in the sense of the symptoms, children not receiving the education which they have human right, that's a symptom. It's a terrible symptom, right? Symptoms can be terrible, but it's only a symptom. What we should be looking at is what are the, um, the causes, what are the genuine causes of that problem? And instead of directing towards a solution, perhaps we should be uh, at the symptom, we should be directing more the cause. So we don't have enough qualified educated teachers. Well, perhaps the solution to the problem is let's work hard to get more qualified um, experienced teachers. So this is one of the things, the problem we've got. We've got a problem, these children not have any education to preserve, but the type of solution that goes in actually just exacerbates the reality. And we need to step back and think, well, what is that, what is that genuine problem? Um, other thing that was occurring to me was, and this is, this is it's partly, you, you guys were saying about how um, thinking about AI and thinking about the way AI is being used, et cetera, makes us question things and, and, and query things that maybe we would have not really thought a great deal about. And the, a classic example in the, in the recent history of AI was Amazon um, using AI to select their engineers, realize that the consequence was they were rejecting all the possible female engineers. Why? Because historically, that's what they were doing without any computers, without, without AI involved at all. So there's an example where, yes, they actually, by the, the introduction of AI, they found a problem that existed they weren't aware of. How did they solve that problem? They just stopped the program. They didn't actually do anything about it at all. They just continued as they were doing. But what it makes me think of is that as soon as we start thinking about um, artificial intelligence, we're immediately um, thinking about questions of ethics, and we immediately start thinking about questions of politics, of democracy, of human rights. It's a really complicated journey, but we can't separate one from the other. And that's what makes, for me, this field uh, fascinating, but also quite, quite challenging. And um, I think my, my last um, comment I'd like to make, and again, this came up from what um, we, everyone has been saying, is that Typically, we think of ourselves, we are humans, there's the technology. And, um, you know, we, we're kind of somehow we're separate from the technology. But the reality is we're not separate from the technology. You know, we exist because of the technologies within which we are embedded. The technology and us were two sides of the same coin. Fire was the first technology, right? And it was through fire that we started cooking food. And through cooking food, blah, blah, blah. So, we cannot think about, in my opinion, separating these two things. Instead, we've got to think about well, how do these two things um, work in symbiosis and what are the contradictions and what are the supports? Um, but yeah, I think that, that kind of that, that, that dichotomy that we introduce um, um, you know, becomes, becomes really quite uh, important that we think it's not us versus them. It's, we're, kind of, it's, we're all here together. And what does that mean for us? And how does that impact on the kind of thing? And I think the final thing I'd comment on is, is, as Leslie was putting it right, we've got to turn this whole, uh, you know, the whole point of this was about um, AI ethics and higher education. Now, in the work that I've been involved in, there's a huge range of tools that have been developed for using K-12 education, the so-called intelligent tutoring system, dialogue-based system, essay marking system, the whole range of stuff. Now, most of this stuff really doesn't work that well at all at the moment. Maybe it will when I'm dead, who knows? But at the moment, it simply doesn't work. But yet it's seen as an easy solution to the problems that clearly do exist in our society. So I think that's separating that out and think about when higher education in particular, what tools really, no, sorry, take a step back, what are the real problems that we have in higher education? What are the challenges that we have? and therefore what tools um, might be appropriate to help us solve those actual problems. 
and I'm, I'm in a building of engineers, so I apologize, but you know, very often in the world of AI and education, it's the engineers that come up with the problems that they then try and solve. But actually they're not the real problems. Um, and we need their expertise. We need our engineer colleagues' expertise, but let's work to find that the real problems that really exist. And let's see, can we use some of these amazing technologies you know, point it in a more interesting, useful direction? Um, I hope that was useful. But... So this gives our conversational uh, uh, contributors an opportunity to re 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 reflect back in any kind of way. My only comment was, I would say, if technology has created the problem, there can be a technical solution. So each way before it's an algorithm, you can have a technology, not in a social technical way. Okay, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you get on the screen? <laughs> Right, there's, there's something actually that came up on the chat, and I know who posted it, so um, I'm on it. You can get, well, uh, it's where that's, uh, here we are, well, well fine, okay. Um, the, 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 I thought this, listening into all the conversations and, and everything, and I thought this might be something that might be missed. So I draw it to everybody's attention, at mine, as much as <laughs> me and Alicia's, Leslie's and Wayne's, okay. <clears throat> Um, it's um, so. I think um, the the this, there was a discussion between some of the contributors on the chat about uh, a Jonathan Dancy podcast, and you can find the link in there called Ethics Without Principles, which kind of sounds like we're leaping to the field of relativism, but actually it quite clearly isn't because that's not what Jonathan Dancy would do. Okay, so I'm just drawing it to your attention if you want to look at a very provocative way, because I think Wayne, it might be a way of trying to answer your question. Okay, <laughs> the, the idea is you've got to define the principle in relation to the problem rather than start with actually saying there is a set of principles which we've actually got to address. Mm -hmm. And it takes us back also, I think, to the uh, issue, the other issue that came from the chat earlier on about what's the kind of human activity and what's the kind of human future and what, what which I think both everybody's contributed has actually picked up and engaged with and therefore, and how the things we've discussed today actually relate to that and when they've been highlighted in all kinds of ways, okay? Um, but there is an opportunity for those who are in the room, okay? Anybody like to come in at the, for the last moment or three with a question, an observation, a comment? Yes, please do. Sorry, you have to shout a bit louder. What aspect? Okay, I'm going to give you a very short answer, not an answer, a response, okay, based on something that we discussed over lunch, because the, bi the bias issue is often treated as a single kind of an issue. And what we, we, we distinguish when we're talking about lunch between two kind of potential forms of bias. So bias in one of the ways that have been described today and several co colleagues have actually commented on the chat around facial recognition, where you can clearly see as a prejudgment about what is acceptable, what isn't acceptable, <coughs> and an algorithm has worked in a particular kind of way. But I'm mentioning to you this book by uh, 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 Yaton, which is called The Constitution of Algorithms. And we'll put the link in, 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 uh, up so that you can pursue it because you can, you can actually download the whole book for free from MIT. And he makes the point, okay, which sounds a little bit controversial, but he's trying to actually uh, open up the discussion about bias in a more kind of nuanced way that whenever anybody conducts, even pre-AI, pre an investigation, they make presuppositions about what they want to look at, how they want to look at it, and what data they're going to collect that exists, or you know, new data they're going to actually, the, the term that exists on new data. And he's saying there isn't a parallel between that and what's happening within machine learning, okay? And therefore, what you have to do is you have to kind of operate with a more expanded conception of bias and say it is not a technical solution, okay? But it's an ongoing issue that has to be, people have to challenge and tackle all the time, okay? And there was a lovely comment in the chat somewhere about um, the, 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 the algorithms of oppression, where the Samantha who posted it said something like, you know, this should never have happened because it was known. So it, it does come back to that autonomy issue, I think, to some extent that everybody touched on at the end. Okay, So it's a bit of a sweep, okay, but do look at those resources because they are really interesting and they give you another way, another angle actually on, on the question that you just posed. So thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you to all our contributors. Thank you to everybody online. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed it. Okay. Sorry about some technical issues to begin with. But I think this is not the heat. It's just, well, not directly the heat, indirectly, because of getting into the room. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm dealing with all the TV problems. Okay, and we will um, see if we can find a, a topic or two um, <clears throat> uh, that comes out of, of this for, for a follow-up event to some description.